This is Malakuta. It's 10.45 in the morning. It's been called an apocalypse, a nightmare, looking like the gates of hell. We can hear the fire roaring. When you have a devastating impact of the black summer fires that we've had, you've got to learn the lessons. This isn't just some far off, distant threat, but it's something that is impacting us profoundly. Malakuta is just beautiful. All these beautiful animals and birds and native creatures and native plants. It will just amaze you that you live in such a beautiful place. In 2019, 10-year-old Matisse Turner's parents woke her in the middle of the night to flee a firestorm bearing down on her Victorian hometown of Malakuta. Sometimes I have a flashback on what it used to be, just green and luscious, but now that it's just burnt and dusty, I kind of lose all of that happiness inside of me. The trauma of the fires here runs deep for Jan Gilbert, who lost her home. Absolutely, embers falling from the sky. As you can see, you can't really see anything. Well, there's a lot of people in Malakuta who can't stand the sound of wind anymore. You were just being, you know, showered with embers and soot and ash. This incredibly red sky and this howling wind that is just, you know, rushing past your ears. Climate change isn't coming, it's here. We're witnessing it now. For young people like Matisse, the threat of climate change is inescapable and inaction inconceivable. I don't think adults really understand how important this earth is because I don't think they really care that much. So they just think they can do whatever they want for it and leave for other people to save it. We are seeing in the climate models that these events are occurring more frequently and more severely because of climate change. Research published last month found the risk of another catastrophic bushfire season has increased by at least 30%. It found a two degree rise in the average global temperature will mean that we're four times more likely to see another black summer or worse. There's a certain amount of dangerous you might even say catastrophic climate change that's already baked in. We're seeing it in the form of those unprecedented bushfires and, and floods. So at this point, we're not going to eliminate catastrophic climate change impacts entirely. Some of them we're already dealing with. The ADF has transported doctors and other medical professionals by helicopter to Malakuta, while another evacuation by sea was completed uh, by HMS Chules. In the days after the fires, Malakuta would become the scene of the biggest ever domestic sea evacuation in Australia's history. It did raise questions about the capability of the Army, Navy and Air Force in responding to climate related risks and ever worsening climate related natural disasters. When you work in the military, you take your risks very seriously and you certainly begin from a concept that we prepare for the potential for things to go really wrong. Former Defence Chief Chris Barry says the Black Summer bushfires exposed weaknesses in how we prepare for climate related disasters. It was a big wake up lesson on preparedness in my view. It was seemed to me a surprise that it took so long for the ADF to be out there helping our communities who are clearly in need. 
uh, started off with the Australian Army as an Intelligence Corps officer, so of course we were looking at the environment that was our job. For a large part of her 30-year career, Cheryl Durant assessed climate risk for the Department of Defence. I then moved on to be Director of Capability Guidance, where I did strategic wargaming. It was pretty clear this was a big issue for defence. Her team assessed whether a surge in extreme weather disasters could eventually overwhelm the ADF. When we did the modelling in 2017, we felt fairly confident defence would have enough capacity to meet its training for warfighting missions and natural disasters up to about 2035. And after that, all bets are off. I pitch on... Um... Cheryl Durant, who's a member of the newly formed Australian Security Leaders Climate Group, says her department's work wasn't always welcomed by the federal government. On many occasions we were instructed don't call it climate change because that's politically unacceptable, which to me was one of the most abhorrent things uh, I encountered in the public service. We were basically told don't go there because of the politicisation of the issue in Australia. And so a lot of the work continued, but really very little of it came to, to great impact because it was just uh, a struggle to sell politically. A friend rang up and said, I hate to tell you this, but the house isn't there anymore. Yeah. In Malakuta, construction on Libby Gregg's new energy efficient home has finally been completed. Today, she's moving in. Do you think people's views about climate change have changed after the Black Summer bushfires here in Malakuta? I don't think so. I think people are very entrenched in their ideas because we have the people who think climate change is rubbish and the people who think climate change is Happening right now, man. So if what happened here in Black Summer wasn't enough to change people's minds about climate change, what is? I think it's got to be government-led in the end for there to be any big movement. You're much more likely to be kneecapped by your own party before you even have a chance to go out and argue your climate change credentials to the electorate. Social researcher and member of the Labor Party, Rebecca Huntley, believes federal leadership has an enormous influence in shaping the community's perception of a complex issue like climate change. In all the research I've done in the last two years, there is a recognition that um, change is happening. It's being driven by corporates, it's being driven by communities, by consumers, by brands. They kind of see the, the federal government as the holdout. <laughs> I don't think the government would necessarily lose anything with the voters that they need to talk to, that, those concerned and cautious voters, the ones that are up for grabs, if they found a way to say, we're just, you know, we're going to embrace this as well. My position has always been about the idea, uh, which is a conservative idea, that we should leave our planet to our kids better than we found it. The bushfires that we saw, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. It was exactly what the scientists told us would happen as a result of climate change. Outspoken Liberal Minister Matt Keane doesn't hide his views on climate change. Last year, he was able to strike a rare political deal to secure the state's transition to renewable energy. The secret is, finding consensus, building coalitions. So for the National Party, for example, it was about jobs and investment into the bush. For Liberals, it was about lower electricity prices and economic growth. Uh, for the Labor Party, it was uh, the environment, it was uh, the moral argument. And for the Greens, it was also about uh, future economies and the future of our environment. Matt Keane is trying to reposition the Liberal Party on climate policy, but he remains the exception amongst his coalition counterparts. I'm a member of the State Parliament, but what I will say is that every state and territory in Australia has the same vision. 
to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And it's become a tribal issue or a matter of culture wars, but it's, it's neither of those things. The Australian government has committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels by 2030. Unlike Australia, several countries have now passed legally binding net zero emissions targets. In a statement, the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Angus Taylor, told 7.30 that Australia is committed to achieving net zero emissions as soon as possible, and preferably by 2050. While ambition and targets are important, he said, it is ultimately action and achievements that matter for the planet. That's why the government is focused on technology, not taxes, and the practical solutions that will make those goals achievable. Australia used to be a much admired country for the leadership it was showing, but in the last 20 years we've just dropped that bundle entirely. There's no question, if we continue on the course that we're on, we are going to see large, you know, substantial portions of currently occupied areas of Australia essentially becoming uninhabitable. If we don't look after this land, it's not going to survive. People are just going to regret their decisions on what they've done to the earth. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.